Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of A Likeable Science here on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us today. Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital, and interesting, and dynamic part of everyone's life, and how we should all embrace science, be excited by science, and, and enjoy science. And with me today here in the, in the Think Tech studio is Dr. Kate Peralt. Welcome, Kate. Hi, Ethan. Thanks for having me. Kate is a professor of uh, forensic science and chemistry at Chaminade University and uh, has uh, some very interesting things to, to talk about. Kate studies odors, right? Correct, yeah. And that's, that's an intriguing thing. Before we get into the show, though, I, I want, want to do a little plug here for the uh, upcoming fall SACNAS conference. This is a, the biggest conference in the world for uh, bringing underrepresented people into science. It's going to be here in Hawaii in the fall, uh, right around uh, Halloween and a few days thereafter. It's a wonderful event. Everyone should uh, know about it. Encourage your students to attend. Teachers should attend. Faculty. Uh, great, great, great uh, event. But now, so how did you get interested in studying odors? That's sort of an odd thing to study. <laughs> yeah, that's a question that I get asked quite a bit. Um, in my undergraduate, when I was doing my bachelor's degree, uh, I was really interested in forensic science. And to be a forensic scientist, you have to study, study lots of biology and chemistry. Okay. Um, that's something I had a great affinity for uh, from a pretty young age. Um, when I got into uh, my third year, I started a research internship in a laboratory. And at that point, I started working with uh, decomposing remains, um, where we were looking at odors and other things related to how bodies decompose. And uh, for me, that was it. <laughs> I, I could see how biology and chemistry could really be used to help people in the real world. And that was really what sparked my interest. Oh, wonderful. No, no, that's, that's very important, is, is that application of science to real world problems. That, yeah, that really, definitely. And that's one of the things we try to emphasize on the show, is that science isn't something that just lives in a laboratory for no reason. It, it actually There's has people, applications. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I suspect a lot of people sort of have an intuitive sense about what odors are, but, but they're, they're really sort of a special class of things, right? Right. OK, so it's good that you ask what an odor is. Um, some people use the words odor and scent or smell interchangeably, and they're right. not actually the same thing. Um, so uh, a scent or a smell, um, the way we use those words, usually um, implies that there is a receiver and that there's some sort of interpretation of that odor. Right, a biological receptor of it. Right, exactly, like what we have in our nose, right, right our olfactory system. Um, when we talk about an odor, though, that's actually a chemical property. Okay. Um, so odors are a big mixture of, of different chemicals that are all combined together. Um, and they kind of give us an odor picture when we smell them. Okay. Um, but it's a chemical property, and it exists, exists whether or not we actually smell it. Okay, so you can have a, a machine that can detect an odor profile that we might not smell. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Some compounds that are present in odor we might not actually smell. Right. Um, and there might be some compounds that we smell really strongly that are not actually present in that high of a level. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. excellent. excellent. And there's a particular class of these compounds. I know that you, you talk about some called volatile organic compounds. And why, why are these, sort of what are they and why are they important? Right, so volatile organic compounds, or we abbreviate them to VOCs, because as scientists right. we like abbreviations. <laughs> um, and VOCs are basically compounds that have what we call an appreciable vapor pressure. And all that really means in simple terms is that they prefer to be a gas rather than to be a liquid or a solid. Okay. So they like to exist in a gaseous state. And when a whole bunch of those chemicals um, in this gaseous state mix together, that's what we call an odor. Okay. And being organic, they have to do typically with life forms. They are parts of life forms or exuded from life forms or whatever. So uh, these VOCs are part and parcel of, of being being alive, basically. Right. They're, they're emitted from different sources. Right. That source doesn't necessarily have to be alive. Um, some of the things that we analyze are not living. Okay. Um, but they are a representation of the, the volatile part of whatever that target item is. Right, right. Yeah. And, and so a lot of people don't seem to think much about smells, except maybe when they smell something awful, right? Right. Uh, like a decomposing body. Right. Uh, but obviously, uh, we've built elaborate sensory systems for smell. They, they smell must have some, odors must have some signal value, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these elaborate sensory systems for them, right? Right, exactly. So um, in the laboratory, uh, if, if anyone's ever watched CSI or Forensic Files, right. you, you might have heard of a, an instrument that's called a gas chromatography mass spectrometry, or okay. GCMS. This is usually the tool in the show, which is um, 
you know, the thing that gives the magical answer, and it happens in a matter of seconds, <laughs> and it's really exciting, right? And then that, that gives an answer investigatory right. information. Um, the way that this works to kind of um, bring it um, to an analogy, maybe, um, it takes a mixture of things and separates them. So if you imagine, say, a group of people who walk into a room, let's say it's a party. There are a bunch of people in this party. Um, some people in the, the group that arrives, they're going to maybe not know anybody, and they might be able to cross the room really quickly. Mm -hmm. Other people might know of a lot of people in this party, and they're going to cross the room more slowly. Right, so they're going to interact with more people. Interact right. with right. more people, exactly. They might have a different affinity for right. people. We talk about affinity in chemistry. And so the way that our chemicals, when they arrive in our instrument, the way that they have an affinity for the instrument mm -hmm. makes the amount of time they spend in it be different. Right. And so they separate. And when we separate things, when they're now in their individual, we can actually then identify what they are and quantify how much of each of them there is. Sure, what, what, precisely what chemical this is and how much there is. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, I guess my question had really been, though, sort of on the other end of things, uh, uh, these chemicals are often used for, by living things to either to defend themselves right. or, in some cases, to locate food or mates or dangerous things, right? Right. I mean, those, those are sort of the big set of uses, probably. There's actually also, I guess, a, a general orientation homing use that can be. Right, yeah. So there's really two major things in forensic science that play a major uh, role in the type of odors we analyze mm -hmm. from remains or mm -hmm. from, from human bodies. Um, the first are insects. Okay. So insects are really good at picking up on these chemical cues right. and finding, for them, it's a nutrient source, right? right? So they're using those VOCs to find a body, and they're really, really good at doing that. Right. The other uh, kind of biological sensor that um, we work with are scent detection canines. Okay. And so these canines are able to search for and locate human remains based on the volatiles that are released from them. They can actually orient, and they do this really well too. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we can use that in cases like missing persons or homicides or even in uh, more large scale scenarios like a mass disaster mm -hmm. where we're actually trying to find a body. Okay, okay. So this, this, is, this is great stuff. So it sounds like you, you do a very interesting spectrum of work then. Part of your work is sort of out in the field, right? And part right. of it's in the laboratory. Right. And your base at Chaminade, so you, you have a, a field site near, nearby. Uh, as part of the campus? Right, yeah, we have um, a couple of really interesting facilities at Chaminade. Um, this is showing uh, our crime scene house okay. that we have. This is a, a really great teaching tool. Um, at this area, we can set up different mock crime scenes. Um, and then we also have a decomposition uh, field site as well that we use to decompose pig carcasses. Okay. Um, so we use pig carcasses as analogs for human decomposition. Okay. Um, and we are able to collect volatiles from them. Okay, yeah. right, because there are all kinds of interesting ethical issues about using human remains, right? Right, exactly. Right, right. And, and logistical issues as well. Right, right. <laughs> yes. Um, and the, uh, when, when you are out in the field, you, uh, you need then to capture these odors, right, to begin your analysis. And I, I think you have a picture of, yeah, right. Yeah, so, okay, so, so I can describe. Right. Um, so basically when we have, um, pig carcasses that are decomposing, um, we place a large stainless steel hood over top of them. So that's this <laughs> box that you see. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually open on the bottom, so it goes over whatever we're collecting odor right. from. That could be a pig carcass. It could mm -hmm. be something else, right? right? Um, could just be soil that we're interested right. in. Um, on top of that stainless steel hood, you'll see there's a, a tube actually kind of sticking out of the top of it. Right. It's about four inches long, it's stainless steel. On the inside of that tube is something called a sorbent. Um, the way I usually describe sorbents is kind of like what's inside of a Brita cartridge if you're filtering water. Okay. Um, so when, you're, when you have a Brita filter and you're pouring water through it, the water goes through and the chemicals that you're trying to attract stick to that cartridge right. and the water flows. We do pretty much the same thing, um, but we pump air through this smaller tube okay. um, and the volatiles that are in the air then get trapped on the inside of the tube on this sorbent and we okay. can take that tube back to the lab yeah. and analyze it. Through your GC. Yes. Right. Correct, right. yeah. Okay. So we take the tube to the laboratory, right. um, we put it in an attachment that basically heats it under a flow of gas, okay. and the heat actually removes all of the volatiles from the sorbent, and we can inject it onto our instrument. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's great. This is, so that's, 
that's a, it's a real nice sort of spectrum of activities and that, that you do from very sort of rough and tumble stuff out in the yeah. out in the woods to, to very sophisticated laboratory based analysis. Yeah, I really like that aspect of it because uh, especially with the background that I had in my education, I got to do a lot of field work mm -hmm. and I realized science doesn't always happen in the laboratory. You got to get out and do the work right. in the field sometimes and that's something that I personally really enjoy. Right, and that's again something a lot of people don't realize is you know, in many cases, actually, a vital part is to you know go out, go out there and find that, find those samples that you need that are going to help uh, determine was there Your a answer. person here, is is there a person buried here, or whatever, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's that's uh, just amazing stuff. Then, <laughs> um, so if if we you, if we use odors, if we smell odors. Uh, I mean, does it have biological significance to our lives? Uh, in terms of safety, for example, well, yes. okay. yeah. So there is, um, we don't do a whole lot of work in this, but there is a lot of environmental monitoring, which is done. Um, for example, a lot of building materials give off these VOCs as mm -hmm. well, and that can have implications in terms of health. If you've ever heard of something called sick building syndrome, right. um, that's, that has uh, VOC background to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we can use the same sort of techniques that we have in forensic science. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of those are adopted from the field of environmental monitoring. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. <coughs> And so, so you, you've talked uh, in our earlier conversations a little bit about, about this, uh, this uh, GCMS machine that, that you use, and, and that it's a very cutting edge machine. So uh, uh, can, you, can you tell us sort of in simple terms what's sort of spiffy and cool and neat about it? What does it do better than older machines? Great, okay, so um, GCMS is something that's been around for a really long time. Right. It's really a gold standard in most laboratories mm -hmm. um, that you can think of, medical laboratories, environmental laboratories, things like that, forensic science as well. Mm -hmm. Um, what we actually use, the instrument you see here, is something called comprehensive two-dimensional gas chromatography. Okay. So this is kind of like the new age of GC. Mm -hmm. um, and what this allows us to do is actually take the compounds and separate them twice, hence the name two-dimensional. Okay. Um, so when we could maybe separate, say, 60 compounds in an odor before, now we have the ability to uh, separate maybe 600 compounds. Oh. So we pretty much get an order of magnitude increase in what we're able to separate. And that has really important implications because if you can separate more, then you can identify each of these compounds better and quantify them more accurately. Oh, okay, so, and this is, Again, something I suspect a lot of people don't understand is that these uh, the, the sort of chemical soup that you're analyzing is, is incredibly rich in terms of it has hundreds, if not thousands, of different chemicals actually within yes. it. And so the, the more finely you can pull this all apart, the, the yeah. more accurately you can determine what's, what's really in there, where it came from, how much right. of it came from what. Yeah, one of the, the things um, that I didn't realize when I got into the field is actually how complex of an analytical problem this, this odor actually is. We have thousands of different chemicals. Not all of them might be important. Some mm -hmm. of them may be important, but we need to separate the ones that are important mm -hmm. from the ones that are not. Um, and they also exist in a variety of different chemical classes. So they all have different behaviors. Right. So you're dealing with a really complex analytical problem. You also have some that are really high in abundance and some that are really low in abundance. Right. And analytically, that's also a big challenge sure. to get a technique that allows you to quantify things at that different of a level. Right. So lots of challenges that we're up against. And that's why this new technology that we've brought uh, to Chaminade uh, gives us a big advantage in what we do. Excellent. We're going to explore that a little more deeply. When we come back right now, we're going to have to take a brief break. Uh, Kate Peralt is here from Chaminade University talking about uh, odors with me. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science, and we'll be back in one minute. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha and mabuhai. 
My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. And welcome back to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studios is Dr. Kate Peralt. Welcome again, Kate. Uh, we're, we're talking about odors, and, and Kate's a forensic chemist, I guess you would call it yourself, yep. and uh, so looks at uh, the chemistry of decaying stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's, that's very interesting because all, all these decaying things are, are putting out all kinds of uh, different chemicals, but there's a lot of other of these VOCs, volatile organic compounds, around too that, that uh, are emitted from, as you were talking about, paints or carpets or building materials but also from explosives, right? Right. Well, most explosives uh, actually emit some relatively low levels of, of these VOCs. Yep. And so I was uh, reading a while ago about, about somebody who had figured out that certain wasps can detect these very low levels, some of these explosives, and they have essentially trained these wasps to make some reaction, either wasps fly left or fly right or up or right. down or something. Some sort of behavioral. Either, right. And so they can build a very simple detector, basically, with just a can with the wasps in it, and they run air through it. And right. if the wasps do a certain thing, they know that what they've got in front of them is dangerous. Yes. So it's, it's a sort of biological version of your, of your GCMS machine, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of interest in developing these sort of like handheld tools that can be brought to certain locations, critical locations like border crossings. Um, airports, for example, um, where you can have something that's portable, that's easy to use, that doesn't require um, a lot of expertise or training, but that provides that kind of yes or no answer. Right. Yeah. And in that case, it's a very specific one. These wasps won't particularly react to anything else. I don't care if you've got a dead body in there, right? You yeah. know, they're not going to care and they're not, not going to react. It's, it's very specific sorts of things, whereas your big fancy GCMS can tell you any of these things, or right. all of them. Right. right. The, the big instrumentation that we use in the laboratories, we use to gain information, right. right? And that information can then serve to develop cheaper, faster, easier mm -hmm. tools that we can use to detect certain things. Right, because it, 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 you can then develop sensors that are particularly tuned into some one of those compounds or two or of those compounds. Or a suite of them or right, something, right, right. yeah. And then that becomes more sort of like what the, what some animals are doing, right, when they're, when they're very right. tuned into very specific molecules. Uh, yeah. The uh, classic case being the, the insect sex pheromones, right, that, that the males are tuned into this one suite of molecules yeah. uh, and can detect them in incredibly low concentrations and hone in on them to, to find their opportunity to mate. Right. right. And there's a lot of interest as well in developing these handheld tools for things like mass disasters where you might right. have... Um, scent detection canines to be able to do some of the work, right. but those are living beings and they need rest and there are right. only so many of them. Right. So if we can develop um, sensors that can at least help in a complementary manner, mm -hmm. then that can really alleviate some of the workload uh, in some of those really um, important cases. Right, so this ties in very much then to uh, some of the developments in material science uh, as they're getting better mm -hmm. and better at building or molecular building at the molecular level, right? Because as you as you provide them with analyses of certain kinds of chemicals, they can say, "Oh, well, we could build this that will neatly trap that and yeah. do a conformational change or electrical change or whatever." And, right. And exactly. A, we provide a, the targets right. for them to be able to then develop those the, the sensors. Uh, sensors based yeah. off of. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. And and this is I mean, people don't I think a lot of people don't realize how important and, and how. Uh, driven animals are by the, by these by these particular molecules. Uh, the classic case was when I was uh, doing a postdoctoral uh, fellowship in Texas. Uh, we uh, were looking at the sex lives of reptiles, and the females put out a sex attractant pheromone as soon as they emerge, 
which if you wipe that off the back of a female, you can put it on a paper towel and present that paper towel to the males, and they will react to that paper towel as if it's a female snake, as if it's an attractive female snake. Right. They will court it vigorously. <laughs> they, will, they will chin rub on it. They will get on top of it and start writhing around, trying their, to do their best to mate with it, even though it bears no relationship other than chemically to right. an attractive female. It's, it's, it's very, very powerful stuff. Right. I think that... Um the, the biology of a lot of these animals and how they react to some of these chemicals is so interesting. And I think as chemists, it's really our job to try to be as good as they are, actually. Mm -hmm. right. um, and in some ways, we're approaching that. But um, I think using a lot of these animal uh, models and the information we can get from those systems provides us with uh, a lot uh, for our field as well. Right. Yeah. And there's, there are a huge array now of studies going on that <clears throat> they've, they've started using uh, sometimes predator scent uh, to help move prey animals, keep prey animals out of areas, basically, where they want uh, the vegetation to regrow or something. If, the, if they're herbivores yep. and they think that, that a leopard or whatever is around, they won't, they won't hang out there. They won't eat the, eat the plants. So. Yeah, there's a lot of that kind of work also being done with pests as well. If right. you know which um, chemicals are an attractant or a repellent for a right. certain pest, then right. you can place those things in different areas to move them where you want them. Right. Yeah. Or away from areas where you don't right. want them. Yeah. And it's, it's incredibly sophisticated chemistry, right? I mean, right. Uh, and uh, another classic case that I recall is the, there's a spider that produces, a, rather than a regular web, a long, one long thread with a sticky glob on the bottom of it, and the sticky glob puts out actually a moth sex attractant pheromone. Oh, okay. The spider has actually learned to produce or learned evolved to, to, to produce. produce that particular chemical. The only thing the spider eats is male moths of one particular species, basically. Wow, it, it that's fascinating. For them. <laughs> but again, it, it's, it's taking the same kind of idea of, of picking up, picking up uh, odor traces out of, out of an airstream, basically. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, this, this is incredible stuff. So, uh, other than those, those obscure uses of, that animals do, We've, you've talked about sort of the forensic and uh, law enforcement people wanting to know about dead bodies. We, we mentioned briefly border agents wanting to know about explosives. But there's probably a lot more uses that people don't think about, right? That people may want to use these. <coughs> yeah, that's definitely true. There are a lot of different industries that use odor analysis um, to get information about whatever it is they're mm -hmm. analyzing. Um, a good example is the food industry. Mm -hmm. uh, odor analysis is used to monitor quality of food products. Um, meat spoilage, for example, is, mm -hmm. is a good one um, that people might, might not be aware of. So you can use the odor that's coming from a package of meat to see if it's spoiled or mm -hmm. not. Um, there's also a lot of uh, work being done with odors to look at food adulteration. So, for example, if you have some, you know, really pure extra virgin olive oil that claims to come from a particular region, is it adulterated with some canola oil or oh, something okay. like that? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can use this type of analysis in other ways that benefit people, too. Oh, okay. um, we're actually starting to work on uh, a project here in Hawaii uh, looking at kava analysis. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the aroma that comes from the kava root. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a beverage which is consumed in the Pacific Islands. Right. Um, there is a lot of interest in potentially using it as an anti-anxiety treatment, mm -hmm. as, as a medicine. Right. Um, and so we're starting to look at the aroma from it so that we can kind of establish a baseline of what that aroma looks like, mm -hmm. and then uh, use that to be able to monitor, you know, where these products are coming from and hopefully um, ensure that there's good quality in them, right. you know. So, yeah, you'll be better able to extract what you want from the kava root and, and get rid of the stuff you don't want so you can make, make a more palatable beverage that... that Sure, yeah. This cough is pretty awful tasting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, mind the taste. <laughs> uh, but same kind of thing, yeah, you can see this with, uh, for instance, coffee. You might be able, with your analysis, to be able to tell, is this really Kona coffee as its label is claiming, right? Because yeah. Kona coffee presumably is chemically different from not Kona coffee, right? Absolutely. It's, it's interesting that you bring that up because last year with my instrumental analysis class, that's exactly what we did. We analyzed a variety of different coffees. Okay. Um, some which were 100% Kona, or claim at least on the right. label to be, some which were blends of Kona and something else, and then some which were completely not Kona coffee. Okay. Um, and so we looked at the aroma profiles from those different samples, and we try to extract what um, is associated with the different brands, right. Right. for example. I mean, did you find what, anything, I mean, are people 
telling the truth? <laughs> um, it's uh, it's hard to really put a blanket statement on okay. it because we analyzed maybe six different coffees. Oh, okay. um, and I think you'd have to do a much bigger project than that okay. to say one way or another. But there are definitely differences okay. between them. Um, and even the Kona coffee itself, that we analyzed two pure 100% Kona coffees, mm -hmm. and they actually look different from one another sure. too, chemically. So that probably has a lot to do with the specific region there, like the, the land that they're being grown on, right? The soil, right. how much water right. they get, stuff they, like that. They call in wine terroir, right? Yeah, terroir, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 it has to do with the chalkiness of the soil, the, the organic compound right. con content of the soil, right? How much rain they've got in that particular year. Yeah. Yeah, all yeah so we can maybe use aroma right. to look at um, the geographical region even. That might now, be something now, of interest too. So that's that's, that's amazing. So uh, if if you had to uh, give some brief advice to students who might want to uh, pursue this kind of area, what 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 advice in in thirty seconds or so would you give them? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think uh, that having a really strong foundation in biology and chemistry is really essential for this field. Um, you have to really have a passion for it. Um, I think communication is really important, being able to talk about your science. Mm -hmm. um, so having a passion for it really helps you to be able to do that. Um, but find something that interests you that you're never going to get bored by. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like with my uh, area of research, I have tons of projects to keep me busy <laughs> uh, until the end of time, and that makes me really happy. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, this is, this is great, and uh, I, I think that's sound advice. I think uh, it's, it's to make be a good scientist, you really have to be excited, excited. passionate about what it is you do. So uh, before we wrap up, I, I want to ask you one completely off the wall question okay. now. So, and without a lot of thought to this, if you had the choice of two superpowers, you could either fly or be invisible, which do you choose and why? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, fly or be invisible? invisible? I think I'd rather fly. Um, because actually we were talking about this earlier that I feel like I haven't seen enough of the world yet. Um, and I think there's a lot of really cool science being done all over the world. And I think having the ability to fly and really be very mobile and experience science all over would be great. Cool. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's been really wonderful to have, have you here. Uh, Kate Pearl from the uh, Shalmanad University of Honolulu uh, as a professor of forensic chemistry and uh, has been studying uh, how, how things decay, and has been here talking with us about odors. And I, I thank you very much. You've 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 enlightened me a great deal, and, and I'm sure it's been a great you. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I would say it's been a stinky conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> but, but it's great. You know, it's wonderful to learn about this and, and to hear about what you do. I, I wish you much much success in your in your stu studies, investigations, and perhaps you'll come back later on and talk some more about it. Absolutely, that'd be great. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for watching Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Until next week, uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen.